going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for joining us for our February Native Plant Society of Oregon meeting with the Portland chapter. My name is Gina Bono and I'm a member and volunteer. Um, NPSO promotes the enjoyment, knowledge and protection of Oregon's native plants. And we'd like to especially welcome any of our new members tonight. As part of our mission, we present a, a monthly feature uh, with uh, guest speakers who present about botanical uh, interests. Uh, so tonight we have Phil Hayes. Phil is a 30 year member with the Corvallis chapter of the Native Plant Society of Oregon. And we will get to his presentation in just a minute. Uh, before we get there, I'd like to review some Zoom etiquette. So while we are in the meeting, uh, we ask that you have your video turned off as well as your uh, sound muted. After the presentation, we'll have a little time to do a social section. That's your chance to unmute yourself, turn your cameras on. This is a great time for new members to introduce themselves as well as for everyone to just connect with each other virtually. If you do have a question during the program, you can find the chat button at the bottom of your screen and just type your question into the chat box and we'll be monitoring that throughout the program. And Phil will address those questions at the end of the slideshow. There's also a closed captioning feature. So you can find that at the bottom of your screen as well to enable live transcripts to see the text on your screen. Uh, looking ahead to our March presentation, we will be hearing from Mace Vaughn with the Xerces Society, and he will speak about at-risk pollinators. So to register for that, you can do so either through our quarterly Calicortis publication or through the Meetup page. So tonight's program coincides with the Portland chapter's annual board member elections um, and a little bit of a time to recognize some of our volunteers. And for this portion, I will turn it over to Portland Chapter President Willow Elliott. So welcome, Willow. Good evening. This is a really special night. First, I just want everyone to, um, who is a member of the Portland Chapter, you get to vote on a new vice president of uh, programs tonight. Um, if you could please locate in the bottom toolbar, you will see you have something called reactions. That's where if you open it up and you click on that, you will see there are two places you can raise your hand. And Ron Klump, can you please turn off your video? We love you, but can you turn off your video? <laughs> and, um, I just need you to, if you are a voting member of this, of this chapter, just click on the upper left hand corner, raise hand, and then it will go away in 30 seconds. Otherwise your raise hand is gonna be raised the entire time of the program. Great. Let me just explain what's going on. We had not expected to really have an election tonight, but we have a new member who has uh, stepped up and offered to be the, uh, to fill the vacancy for the uh, first vice president for programs, his name is Gabriel Campbell. He just joined us from, moved from Seattle to take a job in Portland at PSU as the uh, director of the new botany program management team, I believe. And I'm going to let Gabriel tell you more about himself in a moment. He's going to be working with um, Chris Freitag at the, um, Ray Selling Berry Seed Bank, as well as a lot of other things he gets to do. After we do this uh, quick uh, election where you raise your hand virtually, that's our tradition, then we will also let you meet all the current board members, the other executive committee of fantastic volunteers, and we have a volunteer of the year award we're going to do and surprise somebody. So this will just take about five minutes. And if, uh, Gabriel, can you please uh, enter the meeting? Let us see you tell us a little bit about yourself. 
Hey, can y'all see me? Not really, just a little quick. I don't know what to say about you. You tell us about yourself. So yeah, I'm, I just moved here working at uh, the Oregon Biodiversity Center, Orbic, uh, working on their botany program and directing the seed bank, taking over uh, Ed there at PSU and a uh, new member in the society and try, trying to get involved. Uh, I have a background in native plant horticulture. I moved here from Florida previous to Seattle. So most of my life I've been in the South. Great. Sounds like, sounds like you got rid of your accent like I did. Um, I'm from Tennessee, but you wouldn't know it unless I'm around somebody who's, who's also currently from Tennessee or Florida. Great, well, thank you. All right, if everyone, I nominate, here's what we're gonna do. I'm going to nominate Gabriel Campbell as our new first vice president of programs. Everyone say I by raising your hand. <laughs> see my little hand in the left-hand corner? And then we can see all of that in the participants column. Thank you, Dave Dobeck and all these people who are voting who are members. Anyone opposed? It's too bad. <laughs> no. I think we've got plenty of yays. Raise your virtual hand. I see like 40, 50. I'm happy. We have elected our first uh, VP. Thanks so much. Now I want to go ahead and ask in, in kind of an, an order that makes sense. The, um, I want to recognize a couple other people and embarrass them for our outstanding, um, for the outstanding volunteer work that they have done. We have in our executive committee, Gina Bono. Is it Bono or Bono, Gina? <laughs> Can you come on on screen? It's Bono. It's Bono. Yeah. And you are the? I am up. the Zoom liaison, the MC of the virtual world. <laughs> Correct. And uh, we're going to look forward to uh, not only this is her birthday. Happy birthday to you. I'm not going to sing the whole thing. It's very nice of you to be here with us tonight after having your birthday. And she's also gonna be a new mom here pretty soon. So you won't see her in uh, May and June. <laughs> Great. And then I'd like to introduce Nancy Howarth. She was previously our vice president of programs for two years, two and a half. Is that right, Nancy? Yes. Two and a half. You want to tell us a quick thing about yourself and what you do now for us? Um, right now, I'm the coordinator of t-shirts and I <laughs> take the orders, send them out and correspond with buyers if they are a problem. Hmm. She's the t-shirt and, and bandana queen. Bandanas too, yeah. Yes, we uh, just bought a new bandana. We will have that up on our shop pretty soon. Thank you so much for continuing. Now, this is over three and a half years straight that she and her husband, Frank, have been helping us out very tirelessly. I mean, consistently. And now let's let Frank Howarth. This is the dynamic duo. We, we tend to have dynamic duos in this chapter. We support each other. That's right. uh, I'm Frank Howarth. I'm a retired entomologist uh, and uh, getting to know the of Oregon native plants, um, and I'm happy to be on. I'm I'm a volunteer as the um, uh, PowerPoint um, point man uh, and produce the welcome loop and other uh, creative activities as well as support Nancy in her tasks. <laughs> also, he's he's really our backup IT man. He helps us figure out things we can't figure out sometimes in our in our um, other IT issues. 
Thanks. Um, and for this, I want you to know that the three of you are going to receive, I'm going to turn on my video, you are going to receive a free copy of the Rust Jolly Wildflowers of the Columbia Gorge. See what happens if you volunteer, you guys, you get really fun things. We also give you free lunch when you come to a board meeting, if we ever can have a board meeting in person again. <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Now let's hear from, uh, let's turn off our videos, Frank, and let's introduce the current second vice president of uh, field trips. This is Mary, Mary Hayden. Yes, this is Mary Hayden. I am the second vice president, which means I'm in charge of the field trips. And my other job is to be the editor of our newsletter, the Calicordis. Thanks, Mary. The, all right. This is a very humble person. She uh, does a lot more. She also and her daughter created our website and note cards and all kinds of other beautiful things. Now let's introduce our treasurer, Lisa Shaw. Hello there. I can't see myself, so I'm assuming that my video is working, but so I'm Lisa Shaw and I'm treasurer. And um, I also um, on the merchandising um, team and we do have a new t-shirt design in those extra large sizes that some of the guys have been wanting and some new bandanas. So look for those in the big cartel in the, our shop section on the website. Thank you, Lisa. Lisa also serves on other boards like the natural ma uh, master naturalists, very involved in um, the master gardeners as well. Let's see. Now I'd like to introduce Liz Daly, our fabulous secretary. Can you turn your screen down so we don't just see the top of your head? <laughs> there she is. <laughs> I can't, and oh, there it is. Okay, uh, can you see me now? I can't see myself. Yes, we can see you, thank you. Okay, uh, well, I'm the secretary and um, my responsibilities include sending out the new member welcome cards. And I also send out meeting reminders and surveys and do whatever else they tell me to do without complaining. <laughs> Mostly, yes. I want you to <laughs> I want you to stay and stick around here for a minute. And then Gina's going to uh, put something on the screen for you to see. It's kind of nice for you to be off oh, the 2021 volunteer of the year, outstanding chapter secretary, because you put up with us <laughs> and really very techie, very, very techie. She figured out how to put all of our past recordings up on YouTube so people can see it in the future. And I will send you a paper copy of this in a frame. I'll bring it over. Thanks so much, Liz. You are fantastic. You Thank really you, are. Willow. I, I enjoy my job. You, you definitely don't complain <laughs> when you could. Thanks so much. Alrighty, now it's time for Lisa to finally introduce our program speaker. All righty. Well, it is a pleasure to introduce our Dr. Phil Hayes tonight. Um, he has a Bachelor of Science in Bacteriology and his PhD is in Microbiology. However, he spent quite a few years designing industrial process control computers, but definitely a man for detail. Uh, he seems to appreciate um, photography and has um, for uh, most of his life and um, has the goal of uh, photographing all the beautiful places in Oregon. So he still hopefully has plenty of life le left to do that. And tonight we will enjoy uh, some of his photography on Saddle Mountain. Um, his attention to detail has also led him to be treasurer, probably of the Corvallis chapter, but of another um, Mid-Valley uh, Association 
uh, which is the Alliance for Recreation and Natural Areas. Uh, and that's associated with Mary's Peak. So he must be one of those, um, what do they call it in Idaho? The, the 12, 2012s or something. So he must be going to all the high peaks in Oregon. So uh, Phil, it is a, a pleasure to have you tonight and we look forward to taking the easy route to the top of Saddle Mountain. Thank you. So does that look okay? Switch your display. Can you see the program? Switch it? Okay. In the middle, yeah. You're in speaker notes. Now, do you see the program or do you see my? Um, You're good. Looks, looks okay. perfect. Great. Well, that's the second time tonight it's changed. <laughs> so keep our fingers crossed. Well, um, you know, since I started, you know, since I joined the Native Plant Society of Oregon back in the 1980s, I heard people talking about, uh, you know, stories about the great wildfire communities on Saddle Mountain. But I never managed to visit there for one reason or another until we finally made the trip in late June of 2018. So this was several years ago. And remember, this is in late June. That's when all these photos were taken. Now, Saddle Mountain is off up here in the northwest uh, corner of, this, of the state. You can get there from Portland on US 26, the Sunset Highway, and you go off up, uh, and let's see, it's about 64 miles till you get to the turnoff to Saddle Mountain. Or if you're coming up the coast, like from Tillamook, you can go up um, US 101, north of Cannon Beach to the junction with 20, Highway 26. And then it is, um, another 10 miles in back down Highway 26 to the junction. And the junction's down here. If you turn off that, it's seven miles up a paved road. It's nice road. Um, there's a large parking lot here and there's a tent campground, restrooms, showers, and that sort of thing at the parking area. The park is open year round with no day use parking fee. But the campground is open from March to October and he has an overnight fee of $11. So if you want to stay there, that costs that. They temporarily closed the park for bridge repair in late 2021. So I would check with the uh, state parks website to see if it's open before you go up there now. The trail climbs from the parking lot two and a half miles. Uh, up to the summit of the North Peak, there, there are, there's a South Peak, two Central Peaks, and a North Peak. It's a 1,640-foot um, elevation gain in two and a half miles. Some parts of this are very steep. Uh, the trail is rated difficult, and you need to be in good condition with good hiking boots and all-weather clothing because the mountain's only 12 miles from the coast. And trust me, the weather can change quickly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show some pictures of how to get there because as I said, this is not the easiest hike you'll ever be on. It starts off at a gentle climb. And after a quarter of a mile, you see a turn off to the right to the Humbug Mountain viewpoint. It's an easy 10 minute walk from the parking area. But we passed it by because the forecast for that day called for increasing crowds, clouds and rain later in the day. It was nice and sunny when we started out. So we pushed on pretty hard to get to the top while it was still sunny. 
the huge stumps along the trail, uh, you know, reminded us that the original coastal forests of giant trees had been logged long ago before the state acquired the land. And um, there's a, there is a new younger forest growing up all around there. We found several picnic tables along the lower part of the trail spaced at about half mile intervals. So there's a place there to stop and catch your breath. As you continue up the trail, you come to a good view of Humbug Mountain about two and a half miles to the south. So you really don't need to go down that Humbug Mountain turnoff. If you're going all the way to the top, you'll get to see it, um, a great view of it from, from the trail on up the mountain here. From this point, the trail starts to climb in earnest. This part of the trail is like climbing steps. The average grade is about 16%. Now, I'm from familiar with Mary's Peak and the Mary's Peak North Trail, which was a pretty good climb, is only an 8% average grade. So this thing is twice as steep as the, on average as North Trail at this part. Erosion, of course, is always a problem when you have trails on a mountain. And what they've done here They've created these wire baskets, basically, full of gravel. And they have a very good tread surface. But as you can see, erosion has worked their way around them. But you get a really good uh, traction if you have knobby hiking shoes. But if you have hiking poles, the um, Baskets on the end of them might get caught in some of these larger open meshes. So you have to pay attention. But the, it's a pretty good trail surface. There, are, when we were going up there in March, there were still a few obstacles that hadn't been cleared away. And in wet places, there are these um, sort of boardwalks over them and little bridges. Now, I hope this is the one that they were repairing, because if, this if this was wet, it would be pretty slippery. And there are some places that are just wet seeps, rocky, and steep. So there are a few places along the trail that you have to stop, slow down, and pay attention. But most of the trail is like this. As you climb higher, the vistas open up, and you pass out of deep woods, to exposed rocky outcrops. And of course, there's all kinds of stuff growing on these rocky outcrops. Finally, the trail reaches the middle part of the top of the mountain. The, uh, on the left is the destination, the North Peak. These are the center peaks. And over on the right is the South Peak. And there's this ridge that projects out to the west from the center peak. And it was extremely windy enough that uh, it just about blew me down several times. So it was very gusty out there because it's totally exposed. But the trail doesn't come out here. The trail crosses right over um, the ridge, the little ridge right in front of us there. And then you get to a good view of the North Summit. This is our destination off up here at the summit. Let's see, let me get my cursor back on the right screen. And to give you an idea of the size, you notice this box up here to the left, and there are three people walking in it. Well, that's this little box right here. This tree is this tree, one of the last ones up toward the summit. And from this is on this picture was taken on the middle peak, and it's about a quarter of a mile as crow flies over to the north peak. But from here, you have to go through the saddle and then back up. And the trail gets pretty interesting here because from that center peak, the trail drops about 100 feet in a 30% grade to get to the bottom of the saddle. Then it's a 475 foot climb to the north summit at a 33% grade. Now, if you 
thought that 16% grade was interesting on the way up. This is really steep. And I was beginning to think when we got down here, this better be worth it, you know, because this is going to be a lot of, lot of exercise here. But it was. As we got closer to the summit, we found lots of flowers. Remember the flowers? This is a, a talk about the wildflowers of Saddle Mountain, right? They were everywhere. We met a fellow on the, while we were up there who said he had visited Saddle Mountain every year for 30 years. And the day we were there was the best wildfire display he had seen on the mountain. So we lucked out. Now, when you get to the top, this is a panorama from the top. There's this dike that runs out here, and there's the uh, center peaks. And then this flat spot up here, uh, there used to be a fire lookout from 1953 to 1966. Now, we made the two and a half miles and 1,689 feet in two hours. Because I didn't stop on the way to take very many pictures. Because the forecast said it's going to get cloudy and then might raining, so we wanted to get up here. Now, if, from my past experience with the Corvallis chapter, if this had been an MPSO hike, it would have taken two or three hours longer at least just to get up here because we would have stopped and talked about every flower on the way. We lucked out. We had the summit to ourselves for nearly an hour. We had a great picnic and shared the views and kind of watched as the clouds closed, started coming in. Now, this panorama looks to the west, and that's the coast out there north of Seaside, going all the way up to um, Astoria, and then that's the Columbia River coming across up here. So before the clouds closed in, we could see uh, Mount Rainier, we could see Mount Hood and Mount Adams. On a clear day, you can see from Mount Rainier to, to Mount Jefferson. So this is a Columbia. This is the Astoria. Um, and this is the mouth of the river. And we're got back down the coast. And you can see surf breaking on the, on the beaches there. Good views, even on a partly cloudy day. So when the clouds started closing in, we started back down. And then I turned my attention to the wildflowers. The progress was slow as I took time to photograph almost every plant individually. As it happened, the cloudy bright light was perfect for flower photography. Right up at the very top of the mountain, growing around the post around that, that top thing was this um, bristly phacelia. It's growing around the fence there. It was pretty common up there. And Scalloped onions grew all around the top and they all the way down that, that slope of the north slope. There were lots and lots of these allium crinoidums. And there was Delphinia, you know, Menzies larkspur scattered throughout the meadows. We had Alice's fleabane and blue eyed grass just. Here and there, all through those meadows on that south side of the north summit, there are little white dots out there where the, the flea veins were. And then you look down and there are little blue eyed grass scattered here and there. Martindale's Lomatium, or Cascade Desert Parsley, uh, was already going to seed. Now, this one's one of my favorites, um, it goes up on Mary's Peak. And um, when the first botanist went up on Mary's Peak in 1888, I think, he saw this and said, what's that doing there? This is an Eastern Oregon plant. Well, Saddle Mountain and Mary's Peak or some of these places have isolated populations, um, the high points in the coast range of what probably grew all over the mountains during last ice age. So this was an old friend. Just below the summit, there's a really deep chasm and then a rock dike that juts out to the north. There's a trail that leads out onto the dike and Willie just had to see what's out there. 
She's very adventuresome. That's one of the things I love about her. So if you're afraid of heights, you might want to skip this one, but really it's not a problem. You can see you're really not near that, not that close to the cliff. But the most spectacular collection of plants grew out near the end of this spur. So you got to go out there. So we had catchflies, paintbrush, Oregon sunshine, and all these other things just crowding in the grass and I mean, growing around the trail. Um, they're everywhere. And uh, the Oregon sunshine you know, added that nice yellow, bright yellow color um, in clumps throughout the meadows. And Douglas catchfly is one of my favorites. White flowers are hard to photograph in bright sunlight. Uh, these are some of the, and of course, this cloudy bright was just perfect. These are some of the best shots that I've ever made. You could see details like these oracles stand out clearly from the petals. And if it's bright sunlight, they'd just all be white. They'd be washed out. So this is some of the best pictures I've ever made of this plant. So these pictures made the day for me. I was delighted to be able to get good shots of this plant. <clears throat> But that wasn't all. When we got out to the end of that dike, there was a little stand of noble fir growing right out at the very end at the bluff. And growing in under these trees in the shade was a real surprise. I had never seen this shrub before, but I knew what it was. It's copper bush. So, and we had somebody described it in one of the Corvallis meetings, you know, and I didn't know if I'd ever see it because it's only found in Oregon around Saddle Mountain at the extreme north end of the coast range. And these flowers are very complex with the, the stigma that hooks around and then looks like a bell pepper down here uh, around the ovaries. So this was pretty good. This one also made my day. But then Growing right beside it, the copper bush was bronze bells. This is another one I had never seen. It's found in the coast range only around Saddle Mountain, but it grows throughout the Oregon Cascades and down in the Siskiyous. Well, this is great. I was having a field day. So it was a great trip. Growing down in the shade around there was Schooler's Bellarian. We also saw this down lower on the mountain. So it grew all the way from, almost from the parking lot up to the top in different places. We had the false lily of the valley growing in the shade up there at the, on that dike, but also down again and in shady places along the trail. This is looking southeast from the end of the dike. There's the south ridge and then the central ridge there. Uh, that east side of the mountain is pretty rugged. That dike that I'm standing on isn't the only one. It's a beautiful place. That high south facing meadow on the dike going down um, had huge patches of tiger lilies, columbines, paintbrush, um, alliums, just growing in perfusion. I mean, this was a really, really, really pretty day. Uh, tiger lily or Columbia lily, as it's called, and grew in the meadow below the dock. And we also saw them further down near the parking lot. So they were growing at all different elevations too. Uh, Phil, can I just, it's Willow. Does everyone, uh, is everyone able to see the botanical names at the bottom of the screen? A few people are telling me they can't. Oh. So maybe you could uh, mention the botanical name real quick. Okay. Oh, that's odd. Well, they can't, they can't see the whole... Well, somebody who has a Google book couldn't. Okay. Okay. So we had um, field chickweed or Cerastium arvents and Oregon iris or iris 10x were growing around. There's a lot of the chickweed, you know, it just grows in patches 
um, and then irises were just dotted throughout the meadow. Um, harsh Indian paintbrush or Castilia hispida grew up there. You know, I've always wondered what's so harsh about it. I mean, it's, you know, it looks like other paintbrushes, but the tips of the upper leaves are red and much of the upper part of the plant is covered with, with dense short hairs, hence the name Hispida. It's a hairy paintbrush. And there was a lot of this up there. But there was also scarlet paintbrush. And you'll notice the leaves are all green and it is not really hairy. A little bit of hair on some of this, but not like the Castilea Hispida. But the real giveaway is that the, the leaves are green all throughout. They don't have those red tips. So that's Castilea miniata. Now, we also had um, American bistort up there. Bistorta, bistortes, bistortoides, I'm sorry. And I, I never have gotten around to figuring out what bee that is. It's a nice golden colored bee. It should be easy to identify. Okay, now for all you botanists out there, this one is an unidentified species. I spent hours trying to decide what this was. I used four botanical keys and several online sites, including the Oregon Flora plant identifier, no luck. It has four white petals, they're small flowers, four stamens alternate with the petals, one stigma that has two lobes, an inferior ovary, and opposite or whorled lanceolate leaves with three prominent, fairly prominent parallel veins. You know, you'd think this would be easy to identify, but everything I tried said it was a gallium, a bed straw of some sort. And it may be. Uh, this is one of the guesses I've, I've had that is one of the galliums, but uh, I'm still not sure what it is. So if you recognize it, uh, you can let us know in the in the chat or after the show, you can ask, you know, say what you think it is. Paul just um, identified it as Gallium Boreal. Yeah, that's that's um, that's been the common guess. But boy, when you look at this in the in the descriptions, the texts, uh, and on and online things, um, the the foliage is so compact. It may just be that because this is so high, it grows short and fast. So I don't know, but okay, Gallium borealis is what other people have guessed, and it will. It does fit the key. So after looking at the flowers in the meadow and everything, uh, we decided to start back down the mountain. Um, notice the, the trail, it's, it's a pretty good trail. Um, on the sides here, you, there were a number of rocky outcrops and then there were you know, just dense grass and flowers, including this uh, horacleum, a cow parsnip. Directly in maximum. Now, down here in the valley, these things grow five and six feet tall. But up there, they were in full bloom and they were only about two feet tall. So, I guess, you know, short growing condition, uh, it just grows up fast and blooms while it can. Now, in those rocky outcrops, there were lots of interesting plants. Like this one caught my eye. This is yellow dot saxifrage, saxifraga bronchialis. And according to the keys for Saddle Mountain, this is very a variety uh, Vespertina. Notice, well, first of all, it has these yellowish to orange spots. Now these are, are you know, small flowers. They're about a centimeter or half an inch across. The leaves though, now notice in particular, they, they kind of look like hen and chicks, like a succulent. They have pointed leaflets and are serrated. And they grow right in, just hanging right on the rocks. 
that's not the only saxifrage up there. This is tufted alpine saxifrage or saxifraga cespitosa. No spots on the flowers. Flowers are about the same size and it grows side by side with the other saxifrage. But in this case, the leaf, leaflets are like five fingers, three to five fingers, and it's kind of folded up like a cabbage. So these bunches of leaves are about the same size as this plant, but quite different. So they just grow mixed on the rocks up there. And of course, we have Louisia columbiana, the variety Ripicola, or rosy Louisia. It's small but showy, and there was a lot of it up there. It was quite common in all these rocky places above about 3,000 feet elevation. You know, I, almost every other Louisiana I've seen, you have to you have to work to get there to be able to appreciate it. And in um, we had moist, mossy, mossy outcrops in a lot of places, and the um, alum root or Heuchera micrantha was pretty common there, as was the little leafed uh, miner's lettuce or Montia parviflora over here. This, and both of these grow in moist spots. So these are moist, mossy rock faces. And there was a lot of Oregon stone cropper, Cedum oregonium, and these are just great. They look like old fire pots. I mean, I've seen this before a lot, but I don't, I just never seen any that just looked like they had fire in them like that. So um, that was kind of special. There was quite an assortment of plants on these rocky outcrops. This is an example, you know, where you can see there's uh, larkspurs and paintbrushes and alliums and sedums and, you know, lots of, you know, uh, there's a lamation there. Just all, this is just what it was like up there, scattered everywhere. Now, one of the plants growing here, you can see it growing by a little saxophage there, um, is Lycopodium clavatum, or common club moss. Now, these other pictures were taken, it's something from another place where I, I took some in to get, uh, to photograph the spore producing part of it. Um, it puts up a stalk with a couple of sporulating heads, and you can see the spores here that have fallen out after these, um, after the sporangia open up. We, that's what we would call them if they were fungi. Another one that was dotted throughout the meadows up there is Sedalsia hertipes or hairy stemmed checker mallow, bright, bright pink. Um, this one's pretty rare. It only grows along the coast and only about as far down as, I know it grows at Cascade Head, just uh, north of Lincoln City. I'm not sure if it grows any further south than that, but it's common in the hills along the coast. It's considered endangered or threatened throughout its range. There's a lot of it up there. on Saddle Mountain. This was another one that we were a little late for, the GM triflorum, triflorum variety of ciliatum, uh, or old man's whiskers, grew in patches along the trail. I mean, in big patches, uh, but most of them had already gone to seed. And you can see the triflorum part right here really well. So, these got an earlier start than some of the rest of these uh, plants. This, of course, is yarrow, Achillea millifolium. Uh, there was quite a bit of it up there. Um, I find it just about everywhere around the Willamette Valley and, and then the hills of the coast range. There was a lot of the red columbine, or Aquilegia formosa. Um, 
not only on these slopes on the north peak, but all the way down almost to the parking lot. These were scattered here and there along the trail, quite a few of them. Now, this one, I think this one was new to me, the Pacific anemone or anemone multifida. Um, these are the seed heads. There weren't most, as you can see, most of them had already gone to seed. There were still some flowers, but there were a lot of, a lot of them that are already going to seed when you're in there in, in uh, um, late June. Now this is Kirtim edulae, the uh, edible thistle. And some parts of it can be eaten, they say. Um, Native Americans are said to have eaten the plant and pioneers that came out here uh, were known to eat whatever they could find when they needed food. Um, and I think you'd have to be awfully hungry to want to. <laughs> they can see the, the lower stem, the center of the lower stem or the root or something that's edible. Don't quote me on that, though. There was Nuka Rose, or Rosa Nukana, and uh, Western Wallflower scattered around uh, uh, Western Wallflower, Rhizmium, Capitatum. There weren't a lot of the roses, but they were just scattered, dotted here and there in the meadows. And there were this is a long stalk, long stalk clover or trifolium longipes. I like the clovers. I like to get in there and try to photograph individual flowers. And I've done this in the Corvallis Society where I just show a picture of an individual clover, clover flower and everybody sits there and scratches their head and says, well, we don't know what that is. Because <laughs> you're, you're accustomed to looking at the whole flowering head of the clovers. So this is Trifolium longipes subspecies canum. Wasn't the only clover up there though. We had this Trifolium variegatum. And look at the leaves. This thing is, this was really easy to key out. I mean, this is called white tip clover and you can see the white tips up here. But it's also, it has these very distinctive tooth leaves. And it was, didn't see a whole lot of it, but there were some of it scattered up there along the trail. So it was all through the meadow. And of course we had common monkey flower, Mimulus guttatus, or now it's Erythranthi guttata. And this uh, yellow rattle over here, the Rhianthus cristigali. I don't think I'd ever seen this before. So I think this was yet another new one for me. Uh, that I'm not certain. I may have seen it somewhere a long time ago. I just didn't remember seeing it. But um, there it is in all its glory. It's full of bloom. So here's a view of the center peaks and that, that western ridge. I said it was so windy, you know. And we were getting ready to start back down the trail. And I do mean down, 33% down, and then another 30% grade climbing up here. You see the trail snaking its way up the mountain. So when we got down into the saddle where there were some shrubs and trees and things, where it was a little bit um, shadier, we saw some of this Tolmium incisii or youth on age or piggyback plant. Um, I always thought these, these flowers always reminded me of Chinese dragons with the long whiskers. Well, these whiskers are the petals. The rest of this are the, is the sepals. And uh, it reproduces sexually with these flowers. You know, they're pollinated to make seed. It also reproduces asexually. At the base of the lower leaves, you get small new plants bud out. And these will grow up. They get a little bit larger than what you see here. Then they drop off to the ground and they take root. They're clones of the parent plant. So even if there are no pollinators around, this plant can reproduce anyway. 
an interesting plan. And very challenging to photograph these things because they always grow in the shade. Now, inside out flower is just has been one of my favorites all along. Um, these were some taken up there along the trail. Um, but this one, these are growing in my backyard. I had these growing out back in a patch that, oh, is eight to 10 feet across. And they can hold their own. I've got uh, over, I've been here for more than, you know, 30, 35 years, something like that. And I have, I put native plants in the backyard and they move around. Some take over and fight. They're, they're like butting heads all the time. But this one holds its own against all of them. It's got its territory because it makes very dense foliage and it's tall. So I've got things like wood violets, viola adonicas that come in, viola globellus that come in and um, try to take over everything. But this grows up over them and out tops them. So it's held its own. And of course, some of the oddest flowers you'll see, um, the little round things are the petals. These are the sepals. I think that's right. We had noble fir up there. There were some out on that point that we were on, and this was one that was growing down in the saddle. And you can see it's pretty weather beaten. It tells you a little bit about what the weather is like up there. Aves procera, noble fir. And growing right down in, below the trees, below the noble firs, was goat's beard, Aruncus dioicus. And there was a lot of it, and it was really blooming well. So, and they, these things get tall. This, this one on the left here was probably over six feet, it was taller than I was. Um, we also had mountain arnica or arnica latifolia and western coneflower, Rudbeckia oxidatalis, growing up there in partially shady areas that were, the soil was damp, not wet, but damp. Now, I know you all are familiar with boreal stitchwort, Sabulina rubella. I mean, with a name like boreal stitchwort, you know, but these are very tiny plants. The flowers are less than a half an inch. I don't remember, maybe three eighths of an inch. And I didn't see a lot of them, but there were some scattered around. And when you see them at first, you think, oh, another saxifrage. Um, but it's not like the saxifrages we saw up higher. So there it is, Sabulina rubella boreal stitchwort. And of course, thimbleberry was growing up there. Um, and they were blooming and I didn't find any thimbleberries yet. So they hadn't started producing fruit. And Potentilla gracilis, or the slender sink foil, and spots out through the meadows in the sunny places. Very distinctive leaves makes it pretty easy to identify even if there are no flowers on it. Hey, Phil. Yeah. Before we get too far along, uh, we had a question. How high in the mountain was the Sabulina? Uh, let's see, where are we here? This is down on the lower face of the north slope before you get to the bottom of the of the saddle okay just right in that area where where the noble fur was for the goat spirit and everything as you can see it growing on rocky places that other things don't grow on and it might have been a little bit higher up but it wasn't up i didn't see any of this up at the top of the north summit so this was down close to the saddle I'm working my way down, by the way, if you haven't figured that out yet. So we're about ready to go back up to uh, the Central Peaks. Now, Flux Diffusa is one I find really interesting because we see it all over the place in the Cascades. But 
There's a lot of it up on top of Mary's Peak, and there's some on Saddle Mountain. But if you look at the Oregon flora, you only find that there are like a half a dozen places that this is found in the coast range and only on very high peaks, generally 3,000 feet or more. And it had mostly bloomed. There, I only found uh, a couple of flowers on it. You could see a lot of them that were past blooming. So this was another one that got an early start. Now, when we got down into the into the saddle, and then on, on up over the center peak and back down toward the trail, there was a lot of this tower delphinium, poison larkspur, delphinium troll hypolium, um, in damp and shady places. And particularly on lower parts of the trails, there would be huge patches of this. Nice, nice blue color. Now, when I got out on that spur, that I, that ridge line that juts out from the center peak, where it was so windy, there's Carchiomena growing out there, or farewell to spring. But the wind was blowing so hard, there was no chance of getting a picture of it, particularly on a cloudy day. Um, I tried, they were all blurred. But fortunately, this also grows lower down on the the central peak down closer to the campground, we occasionally came across a patch here and a patch there. Now, I was really interested in the Clark Hills, still I am, but I was made it a point to draw and photograph all the Clark Hills in Oregon, and I've succeeded finally. Um, there are two of the Clark Hills, Clark Hill Amina, that and where all four of the uh, sepal lobes split when the flower opens and turn to one side, Clarkiomena and Clarkiogracilis. The difference between the two is that Clarkiomena's buds are erect, and the flowers look a lot alike too. Although, well, I haven't seen that many Gracilis, but I, I know Amina is very is variable. Some of them have set of white down here, they have bright red down in this. There's a lot of variability in Clarkia. Archaeomino. But the buds stand erect. Where on Gracilis, this would be drooping. They all, they don't stand up straight like this. They droop over. Otherwise, the leaves and the plants look a lot alike. The flowers look a lot alike. And these sepals split one as, and fold aside as a group. The other Clarkias, when the sepals split and the flower open, the four sepals come out individually. So um, as I said, I've been interested in, in the Clarkias. These farewell to springs grow along the hillside, along roadsides, road cuts down here around Cordellas. And then you'll have these 50 to 100 foot long pink road cuts just covered with them. And last summer I took a a seed pod from somewhere around here. And I put the seeds out in a pot out back. And I have dozens and dozens of little seedlings coming up. Well, I've tried to grow this in my backyard before and it really doesn't like it back there. So we'll see if I can get any of these seeds to grow. Plectritus congesta or, or sea blush grows any place you have a soggy ground. Uh, you'll get get the uh, sea blush sometimes in really big pink patches. If you've ever been up to uh, Basket Slough up on uh, Basket uh, Butte, there are big patches of sea blush up there in the meadows in the spring. Now this one is an interesting one. The large fringe cup or telemigrandiflora. These are the ones that were growing on Saddle Mountain. I have these growing in my backyard. And I have lots of pictures of the ones from my backyard. And they rarely open out like this. They, the, the, the petals just fold back. And although down here, a lot of them are, are red, either red or white. Well, these are pink. 
they opened out very freely. So that's two morphologies, morphological differences in this Telema grandiflora. But if you go up in the Columbia Gorge, and I can't remember what waterfall it is. We walked back into one of the waterfalls. Don't remember which one right now. But the Telema grandifloras up there in the gorge are huge. These petals are much larger and divided three ways before they have all the little fringes on them. But according to the keys, they're all the same species. They're just slightly different varieties in these different places. Okay, so we also had the white wind flower, the anemone deltoida, in the shady places, and soundberry. But you know, like thimbleberry was just starting to bloom and only had didn't have any berries on it. Soundberry is then in see, a single flower, and we saw quite a few of the berries developing. So, so Rubus spectabilis is another another one that gets an early start up there. This is Penstemon serulatus. Now we're coming down the central peak back toward the parking lot here. And as you can see, this stuff grew right by the trail and there was a lot of it. I don't remember seeing any of this at the higher elevations, but there was a lot of it down there. Oh, a thousand foot elevation or so. You know, just right along, just growing alongside the trail. And this was another one. These were growing, oh, a quarter of a mile maybe from the trailhead. These are nodding onions or allium cernuum. You can see where they get the name nodding onion. And they have these bunches of long leaflets, which is not uncommon for onions. I did see something like this growing up there on that north, on the, on the south facing slope of the North Peak, up a lot higher, but there were no flowers or buds. So I suspect it was the same one, but who knows, it could be an entirely different onion. But there was a lot of this along this lower trail. So now we're coming, we're getting close to the parking lot again, as we came through, just like the forecast said, we had a, a, a light mist falling. So we got down off the mountain just in time. It hadn't started raining yet, but it certainly was threatening. So after seven hours and 900 photos, we got back to the car. That's right, 900. So you thought you were looking at a lot of them, but I didn't make you look at all of them. It was a wonderful hike, and I recommend it to, to everyone. I mean, I'm 77. I'm in the geezer class, I guess. And we made it, and William and I made it up there to the top, pushing it in two hours, even though there were some very steep grades there. You can always stop and look at the flowers, catch your breath. So are there any questions? Well, I haven't really ha seen many come up in the chat. So maybe people will um, be willing to just unmute themselves and ask you questions. No, there's, there's a bunch of chat, 33 in the, in the chat. Um, Like what family is Sabulina in? That's what textbooks are for, people. I don't, I don't remember. Oh, here it is in the Caryophyllaceae, apparently. Does Paul Slichter agree with that? He's in the crowd. <laughs> the date was in. Um, late June. And hadn't you said 2018? That was in 2018. Yeah. As far as whether that was an uh, unusual bloom year or not. Well, that's what, you know, the, I've only been there once, so um, 
I have high expectations for the place now. But the fellow who had been up there before um, said that, you know, I've been going up there for 30 years and said it was the best bloom that he had seen. And it certainly was good. We weren't disappointed. How much exposure is there along that trail? The lower parts are in the woods. You can kind of see that from some of the pictures. When you get up, um, up to that central peak, it was really, really windy out on that ridge that ran out. But the trail doesn't go out there. I mean, unless you want to go down there. And I didn't notice any particular wind as we were going up the, over the trail. It's only when I got out there on the end of that point, it was blowing hard enough to knock me down. But when we got up on the top of the mountain, there was hardly any breeze at all. It was just perfect. But I, but it's once you go up past that central peak and you start down, you get in that saddle. I suspect you could see that tree that I showed a picture of it. That you know the wind blows in there really hard sometimes. It's pretty much exposed once you start down into the saddle and go back up to the top. Um. Lisa, are you tracking these new questions? There's a couple of new questions in the chat. Well, somebody asked. Well, uh, it looks like Phil's reading them. Sometimes, yeah, Phil, sure. you know yeah. what? You, you did a good trick because sometimes the presenter can't see the chat, but somehow you're able to see the chat. So <laughs> this whole thing's been pretty unpredictable, as you know. Yeah. But anyway, yeah, I can. So somebody says, what camera and lens do you prefer to photograph with? Well, I have a Nikon. It's a 5200. The latest version is 5600. I like it because it's light. I take this thing, when some of this with me when I'm backpacking. And so it weighs about half of what the big professional bodies were. It's 24 megapixels. And it does everything I, I want it to do. But on the lenses, um, on doing something like this, when I'm looking at plants, I have two lenses I use. One of them is a, is a Nikon, Nikon 105 millimeter macro lens. It's an incredible lens, great depth of field. Um, and it gives a one-to-one a, a -one image on the photo element. All the other lenses reduce everything to quarter size or, or less, of course, because of distance. So it gives you a nice big image, great depth of field, as a sharp image, really nice blurred um, bokeh, they call it, the back for the background. Um, so that's Nikon 105 millimeter macro. That's my flower lens the one I want when, like when I was up there that's the one I had on the camera when I'm hiking I have a 70 to 300 millimeter zoom lens that I use and it stays on the camera because it will focus down to four feet and at four feet I can take pictures of these plants that are right down at my feet and actually get pretty good you know get I can't get the magnification I get with the macro but something like uh, an iris will more than fill up the field at that distance. And I photographed little tiny insects and everything. It's a very sharp lens. But of course, that's at 300 millimeters. I can back out to 70 millimeters and get pictures of groups of plants and all that sort of thing. And I have a wide angle lens. The, the pictures of the mountain and all those panoramas were done with a, a very good um, 16 to 80 millimeter wide angle zoom. So those are the ones I, I carry uh, two of the lenses in my camera bag and one on the camera when I'm out doing something like this. But if you're really into, and notice there are really fancy camera bodies out there that do all sorts of things more than the one I have. I don't even use all the features on the one I have. So I'm happy with it. It's what marketing people call prosumer, a professional consumer right now. How's that for nonsense? Um, but I've been very happy with it.
There was another question about the uh, cardamine uh, Patterson, Pattersoni. I know, I saw those and I don't know. Um, Saddle Mountain Bittercress. Yeah. And on the map, it's only up there. Yeah, and if it was there, um, I guess I didn't see it. Somebody asked, uh, do you know about the geology of Saddle Mountain? Well, that's, this is one that, the current popular theory is that that is lava that came out of Eastern Oregon about 14 to 18 million years ago. At that time, there was no Columbia Gorge. Um, the lava flow followed the, what, a river south of Hood, Mount Hood, then out down what's the Columbia Gorge and out to the coast and that Lava is supposed to be lava that solidified when it hit the ocean water. I've read that um, in a number of geology books. Bob Lilly is a friend of mine. He's a geologist uh, down here at the university, or he's emeritus now. And he says um, that's when, that, that's the current theory, for, because that lava this is the same lava that was over in eastern Oregon. Does anyone want to comment on, do you ever take any plants home from, for your garden? <laughs> My feeling about that is know what it is. Um, and I, I mean, I remember from one of my classes once somebody was talking about a, um, some botanist in, up in um, New Hampshire or something found this really rare plant growing on a rock and took a couple of samples, took it back and it had never been seen before. And it hasn't been seen since because only when they went back, there weren't any left. So for something that grows everywhere, um, what I will do sometimes is I'll collect seeds. And my rule of thumb on that is throw about 75% of them back into the into the bush around there, if I'm gonna take any at all. But I don't do that very often. And like I say, it's only on the things that are really common. A lot of my plants came from uh, Esther McAvoy. We have a native, we used to have when there was not a pandemic, native plant sale down here every May. And um, a lot of people would donate plants to put in that. And so uh, some of the stuff in my backyard came from that. But don't, if you, unless you know exactly what it is and you know that it's really common, I would leave it all out there. You don't want to be the person that takes the last one. I don't remember what the yeah. sign says at the bottom of uh, the trail head, but I'm pretty sure it says yeah. um, it's protected area. It says plants grow by the inch and die by the foot. Yeah, well, I think. Or the hand if you take them. <laughs> There yeah. used to be a sign that was a little more specific that got taken down. There was a question about comparing some of the plants that you've seen on Saddle Mountain with those on Mary's Peak. Yeah, the, the uh, Plox diffusa, Martindale tillamation, Allium crenulatum um, are three that we have a lot of them on Mary's Peak. but. Actually, the area that we have them up there, even though it's six or 700 feet higher than Saddle Mountain, all of these are in a very small area in the top 200 feet of Mary's Peak. It's um, about 4,600 feet. And um, those three in particular are Eastern Oregon plants, Cascade plants that we have on Mary's Peak and then I saw up, up there on the mountain. A lot of others like um, tiger lily, um, yarrow and the iris and things like that also grow on Mary's Peak. There are a lot of them that are common, but those three in particular are really pretty rare in the coast range. They only grow on these really high points. Are they mostly on the balds as well? 
Yeah, on Mary's Peak, um, there are some very large meadows on Mary's Peak and a big, huge, uh, pure noble for, for a forest, the only one in, in the coast range where it's just all noble fir. But the top of the mountain is really, really nasty in the winter. You know, 120 inches of rain, 100 mile an hour winds all every now and then, a lot of ice and snow. Um, on a normal year, we have snow all the way up through the end of May. So the growing season is short. And these, the, the very summit up there is all these grassy meadows. Very, just occasional one tree here, one there that's managed to hold on. And then in the night, late 1950s, the Air Force bulldozed the road to the top and put a radar site up there. Never even got it turned on. The wind blew the antenna off the mountain that, that winter. And they said, oh, well, we didn't need a radar site up there after all, but after trashing one of the most pristine places in, in Oregon. Um, but they did make a rock cut. And a lot of these plants are growing in those exposed rocks. And then there's also a, a, what we call, that's called the rock garden below the road there. That I call the little Oregon, our little Western Oregon desert because it, it has desert-like conditions and it has Eastern Oregon high desert plants growing in it, even though that place gets 120 inches of rain every year. It's a very unusual, but it's totally exposed, doesn't get the wind blows the snow off, so it doesn't have a lot of water on it. It's very dry and just gets baked dry in the summer. So um, but that's where the most interesting plants grow, right up there in that top 200 feet elevation of the mountain. You're getting lots of thank yous. Are you seeing that, Phil? Yes, I can't keep up with them. <laughs> well, see, it's worth all the pain sometimes. Yeah. I'm getting Zoom to cooperate with PowerPoint. Yeah, we had, that was a whole different story. Somebody in here said Oregon State Park probably has rules against collecting plants. No, it's not probably, they do. Uh, Forest Service does. Um, uh, BLM does, state parks does. Down here, the College of Forestry State Forest have rules against taking plants, so you don't do that. But Saddle Mountain's not a state park, is it? It's a state natural. It's, a, it's called the, um, um, gosh, it has a special term. <sighs> it's, I think it's state natural area. Uh, it's got that funny name, the Swala Loose. Uh, uh, botanic um, oh, yeah. region is the name, well, one of the names, that but area, it's not a state park. No, that, that area up there where it is, is that botanical region. And uh, Saddle Mountain, the state park, Camp whatever Ground? it is. The is campground? Oh, it's a pretty nice campground. It seems to be if you do want to go, it's a state natural area, says Sue Donora. Thanks. Um, you know, if everybody wants to go ahead who wants to still hang on and let's talk, go ahead.